Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. As I look around, I'm always curious when I speak, whether it's to my class or to groups like this, whether uh, what I learned in first grade is uh, still true. Uh, the troublemakers sit in the back of the room, <laughs> and the A students sit in the front of the room. Yeah, see, nothing, nothing changes. Uh, I uh, want to talk about the presidency in Florida. Uh, we are in the, the heat of primary season. And uh, when I started studying Florida history, I was amazed by uh, how many answers to the question, who thought of this, uh, was Florida? Um, and the answer to the question, who thought of these primaries, is Florida. It's Florida that creates the primary system more than 100 years ago uh, and is copied by other states soon after that. Um, <clears throat> but it's our fault. Um, the, the other thing uh, is uh, we, uh, one of the legacies of the Civil War in Florida, uh, actually a legacy of Reconstruction, has been to create all kinds of offices. Uh, some of you from the North may be surprised at some of the elective offices that are here in, the, in Florida. The idea was to diffuse power so that you know, no one person, as in Reconstruction, uh, could have absolute power. Um, I mention that because one of the offices in Florida is election supervisor, and most places in the North don't have that. They have somebody who works for the county or the state who runs it, uh, and the election supervisors have wide uh, powers uh, to make their own decisions. And so what's ended up happening is uh, you can tell whether you live in a Republican county or a Democratic county by early voting. Um, early voting in Democratic counties lasts longer. In Republican counties, it is shorter. So in Orange County and Osceola, which are Democratic counties, uh, early voting started two days ago. And I think it starts tomorrow in Lake County. And then, uh, pardon? Is it, is it Friday? Uh, um, and then... Saturday, one Saturday and one's tomorrow. And so uh, we can't even agree on when to start voting in this state. Um, just a, a short thing to set, it, set this up. Uh, Florida, we know, is a Spanish colony. And we know so little about that. Most of us went to school in the north where we studied largely British history. And uh, uh, we don't know much about our past. The Spanish rule Florida from 1565 to 1763. They bet on the wrong horse in the French and Indian War. As a result, they give up Florida to the British. In 1776, Spain bets on the right horse. They bet on George Washington. And as a result, when the revolution ends, uh, Britain has to give up Florida. So the British rule Florida for only uh, a 20 year period, 1763 to 1783. That is an extremely important, as you know, period in, uh, in Florida history. Um, and again, we don't study much about this. Florida becomes a key uh, for King George and for the British. You know, so, so that when we took the, our history, British history, uh, we talked about Cornwallis and battles in South Carolina and Georgia and North Carolina that culminate in the Cornwallis surrender at Yorktown. What, we, uh, what nobody mentions is that most of the troops that Cornwallis had at Yorktown were Florida troops who marched up from St. Augustine or sailed up from St. Augustine, either one, and joined Cornwallis for the march north. So many of the troops in these classic pictures were Florida troops. Florida becomes home for uh, the Tories who are escaping the 13 colonies. Uh, it becomes a haven for runaway slaves. So um, George Washington would be very surprised to know that we celebrate his uh, birthday here. Uh, and because he hated Florida, and uh, the feeling was mutual. 
both as a general, it was a thorn in his side, and then when he became president, it was a burden for his entire eight years as president. He has to deal with all kinds of issues in Florida. The Seminole Indians are invading uh, Georgia uh, and uh, uh, committing crimes and then coming back across the border. The Spanish are too weak to do anything about it. Uh, hundreds and thousands of slaves are escaping from the north and uh, coming to Florida and the sanctuary provided by the Spanish. So early presidents like Washington have a, a great hatred for Florida. It's nothing but a, uh, a pain in the neck for them. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson becomes president and tries to steal Florida. Uh, when he makes the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, <clears throat> excuse me, he, uh, he claims that Florida was part of the deal. And everybody, no, it wasn't part of the deal. <laughs> but, uh, but he tries to do that um, and, uh, and fails, uh, fails to uh, accomplish that. This is Andrew Jackson. Um, he's another guy who hated Florida. Uh, I don't know what there is about presidents in Florida. Um, Jackson only came here to kill people. Um, and as some of you may remember, as president, he invented the spoils system, giving jobs to his friends and, and former military aides. Uh, he tried to do that in Florida. He was named the first territorial governor after Florida was purchased from the Spanish in 1821. He wrote to, the, uh, to Washington, D.C. and said, hey, I want to name so-and-so to this, so-and-so to that. The president said no. We're not doing that. Uh, we'll, we'll name the people here. The result was Jackson got in a snit and left. He quit. He wrote a letter and said, I resign. And the president wrote back and said, could you at least stay till we name somebody else? By the time the letter came back, Jackson was already back home in Tennessee. He only served here for a few months as territorial governor. And yet our largest city, Jacksonville, is named for him. And there's a county name for him. But uh, his excursions into uh, uh, Florida uh, usually ended in brutality. Uh, three people, Jackson, Zachary Taylor, and Teddy Roosevelt, came to Florida to fight. And all ended up in the White House. So there's something, uh, something to be said for that. This is Zachary Taylor. Um, Zachary Taylor is... Uh, 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 Indian fighter, and uh, he gives us uh, a cliche, uh, which many of us use without realizing it. In fact, uh, people in Texas stole our cliche. Um, uh, what would happen in these wars with the Indians is that the young soldiers had never experienced anything like this. The Indians would strike without warning, they'd circle the camp, we were used to, you know, British, where you march and then shoot the guns. And for, the, for the, these young soldiers, this was a scary experience. And so often when the, when the fighting started, they would run away. Well, two things happened. One, there was no place to go to. They're in the middle of a swamp, hundreds of miles from anything. And secondly, most of them regained their courage after the initial shock and came back to... Uh, to camp. And so uh, Zachary Taylor wanted them as soldiers, but he also needed to punish them. And he couldn't hold court martials in the middle of the swamp, and there was no jail, and you know the nearest military base was uh, uh, 100 miles away. And so he decided that the best punishment would be to shun them and to, uh, you know, to have the men treat them as, uh, as pariahs. Uh, and so when the soldiers would come back to camp and they would see the, the, the one-time deserter, uh, they would be told, uh, don't have anything to do with him. Shun him. Make it clear that he has done wrong. And so when it came time for dinner, he would tell uh, the soldiers, uh, don't, don't eat with him. In the military, eating is called, do not mess with him. And that's where it uh, came from. 
when he gets to Texas in the Mexican-American War, he takes the punishment with him, and so Texas become, becomes, don't mess with Texas, which should be, don't mess with Florida. So don't, don't trust Texans. Uh, again, Taylor goes on to, uh, to become president uh, and starts his, his uh, military fame here in uh, uh, Florida. Uh, this is uh, Lewis Powell. Um, and the Civil War is strange in Florida. First of all, Florida is the smallest state in the Confederacy. In fact, Florida will remain the smallest state in the South until the end of World War II. Um, it's hard to imagine it being that small. Uh, of the 600,000 Confederates who fought, uh, only 15,000 came from, from Florida. It was not a very significant uh, state. But in 1864, Abraham Lincoln gets this crazy idea. He thinks he is going to lose the presidency. Uh, and a lot of people agree with him. He is scrambling for ways to, uh, to come up with a, with a plan to win the election. And as you know, as you'll remember, he went through a whole bunch of generals and fired them and then brought them back and fired them again. Uh, but he always let them run the war. He'd complain about how badly they were doing it. But Florida is the only case where Abraham Lincoln plays general, and it's a disaster. His scheme is to win a decisive victory in Florida, take the capital of Tallahassee, and bring Florida back into the Union, and restrict the voting in November so that he would gain Florida's three electoral votes uh, and help win another term. And so over the advice of his generals and everyone else, he orders troops to Florida. They fight, even though they outnumber the Confederates, uh, they fight a battle uh, in uh, north central Florida at Alusty and are humiliated. They are just routed. And it ends Lincoln's dream of bringing Florida back into the Union. And um, it, it uh, also um, uh, means that... Uh, uh, Florida will stay in the Confederacy uh, until the bitter, uh, to the bitter end. He, of course, goes on to win the election without Florida. Tallahassee will be the only Confederate capital east of the Mississippi not captured by Union troops. Uh, at the end of the war, of course, um, Lincoln goes to the theater. Uh, John Wilkes Booth, uh, is staying at the boarding house of Mary Surratt. And, and Mary Surratt and her fellow boarders are all very strong Confederate sympathizers. They include this man, Lewis Powell. And Lewis Powell clearly has mental issues. Uh, we would, you know, diagnose that today. He was from Live Oak, Florida, up here, uh, again, north central Florida, between Jacksonville and Tallahassee. And he joined the Confederate Army at the start of the war, and then deserted, and then joined the Union Army, and then deserted that, and by the end of the war was hiding out at Mary Surratt's boarding house in Washington, D.C. He is given the task of um, killing the Secretary of State, William Seward. He botches it badly. Uh, Seward ends up with a terrible scar on his neck from a knife wound. Uh, but uh, in the end, Powell flees and Seward survives. He is quickly captured and he is executed. His father is a minister in Live Oak and here's what's happening and heads for Washington, see if he can help his son figure out what's going on. Before he can get any distance at all, the railroads are torn up and everything from the war, he finds out that his son has already been executed. It begins a campaign um, by the family that lasts more than a hundred years. They start writing to the government saying, we'd like to give our son and then grandson and you know, so on, a Christian burial. And the government truthfully says, listen, uh, all these people were buried secretly under the military prison 
uh, was done at night by a special squad. Nobody really knows for sure. Um, and then the prison itself was torn down. And the family kept writing these letters. And uh, meanwhile, the father uh, became the object of scorn because there were Union troops in Live Oak. And so he moves down to this little village uh, in what's now Orange County uh, and becomes the founder of the town of Oviedo, Florida, if you've ever been there. And uh, so for 100 years, the family keeps writing, and the federal government, when they bother to respond, keeps saying, listen, here's what happened. Finally, they write a letter, and somebody sends it to, forwards it to someone else. It turns out, uh, this is grisly, that when they executed Powell, they thought he might be insane, and so they uh, uh, cut off his head um, and sent it to the Smithsonian to see if he was insane. So the Smithsonian said, yeah, we still got his head in the warehouse. <laughs> and so they sent back Lewis Powell's head, and today it's buried outside of Oviedo in Geneva, uh, Florida. Um, this is uh, Chester A. Arthur, uh, who, whose biography was called The Accidental President, which gives you an idea of what he accomplished. Um, any of you uh, who are retired government workers should uh, light a candle to uh, Chester A. Arthur. He's the one who created civil service. Um, he uh, 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 becomes president upon the death of James A. Garfield. He comes to Florida. He is the first president to come to Florida. This is 1883, and no president has ever come to Florida before that. He comes down through Orlando and spends a day in Kissimmee. And he is told that he cannot go any further south than Kissimmee. That the President of the United States is forbidden from going south of Kissimmee in 1883. The reason is there is no telegraph line. And the President cannot be out of touch with Washington. And so think about how empty South Florida was from Kissimmee South that as of 1883, uh, you already had cities in, you know, San Francisco, big cities, uh, Los Angeles, Seattle. And yet uh, in 1883, Miami hadn't even been started yet. There's nothing, almost nothing down there. There are a couple forts in Fort Lauderdale and Fort Myers, but that's it. Uh, Arthur wants to go fishing. He, he loves to go fishing, and he, uh, uh, they head to Kissimmee, and uh, he uh, asks for a location, and one of the locals says, there's this great creek nobody knows about, and gives him directions. And he says to his aides and everybody, he said, okay, let's all go fishing. And they say, well, we don't want to go fishing. Uh, we found out about something new. And we'd rather do that. We can go fishing in the north. And Arthur says, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, you rent a boat and go out on Lake Toho and shoot alligators. <laughs> and we want to go shoot alligators. And so with a, one other guy, the President of the United States goes off looking uh, for this, uh, this creek. And he finds it. And sure enough, fishing is fantastic. Comes back with all kinds of fish. He's, he raves about it, and he says uh, it's the greatest fishing in the world, just the perfect spot, and he's uh, really happy with that. Um, what amazes me is that 80 years later, Walt Disney goes to the exact same creek, Reedy Creek, and builds Disney World at Reedy Creek. It's just <laughs> a fascinating coincidence that they find it. By the way... Uh, he also picks up one other thing in Florida, uh, a terrible sunburn, which puts him in a horrible mood. And so the train leaves Kissimmee, and they're supposed to stop in Orlando. And uh, as they approach Orlando, the whole city is turned out, and the band starts playing. And uh, he says, what's going on? And they say, well, we're going to stop, and you're going to wave and say hi. I don't want to stop. He's in a crummy mood. He's sunburned. And 
in pain. And I said, well, you got to look at all the, no. And finally he says, I say we shall not stop in Orlando, which is the first time a president had ever used the word Orlando. Uh, and so the train now picks up steam <laughs> and everybody's standing there and the band's playing and they <laughs> go right through, uh, through Orlando. The other president who did not stop, who forgot to stop, was William Howard Taft. Uh, his train just went barreled through, even though the band was playing. Uh, and they forgot. And they were down the road before they figured it out. Uh, Taft, um, uh, we were so happy that a president had even come through. We named a town after him. Uh, Taft, Florida is, uh, is still uh, there. This is Grover Cleveland who came down. He loved Florida. Um, uh, he uh, would come down to Titusville. This was uh, taken in Rockledge. He came to uh, Orlando uh, and uh, a town, uh, Maitland, which some of you are familiar with outside of Orlando. Um, he uh, 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 was almost, his Secretary of War was almost killed. The road was so bad that the carriage hit a rut and threw the Secretary of War out of the carriage and badly injured him. And everyone in the carriage was shaken up. And uh, he complained that uh, it, uh, the roads were so bad in Florida that it took an hour to go just a couple miles from Maitland to Winter Park, uh, which is, of course, about what it takes today to go from <laughs> Maitland to uh, Winter Park. Um, this is a parade. <laughs> It doesn't look like much of a parade. This is a parade for William McKinley, the President of the United States. Um, the, the question is, why doesn't this look like much of a parade? And the answer, of course, is McKinley was a Republican. And the Democratic governor had no intention of giving a nice parade for a Republican president. So this is the, the parade in Tallahassee for William McKinley. Uh, the guy on the far right, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, comes down for the uh, Spanish-American War uh, with his uh, Rough Riders and literally uh, forces his way on the ship. He and his men were not scheduled to go to Cuba. They literally pushed another regiment away and forced their way onto the boat with their the ship with their horses in uh, in Tampa Bay. Um, he becomes uh, fascinated with Florida and he uh, uh, sets up preserves. Uh, the first bird sanctuaries, federal bird sanctuaries, are created here in Florida uh, by Roosevelt to stop the poaching of birds with beautiful plumes which were used to make hats. Um, and the Ocala National Forest was founded by uh, Teddy Roosevelt. So he had a real strong interest in uh, Florida. This is Taft at Key West. He finally made it down um, for the over, Overseas Railroad, William uh, Henry Flagler's Railroad that went from Miami to the, uh, to the Florida Keys. Um, the, uh, uh, this is a... Uh, um, a speech um, given at Coral Gables. Not very good quality, I apologize. But you can see the hundreds and hundreds of people who have gathered uh, to hear William Jennings Bryan, the three-time presidential nominee of the, the Democratic Party. Uh, Bryan, after uh, running for president unsuccessfully, you can see him on the far left there, um, ends up doing what we're all doomed to do in Florida, sell real estate. <laughs> he, uh, he, uh, he is hired by the developers of Coral Gables. And his job is, these are people who are coming down to look at property. And, uh, and his job is to convince them to, to buy property in Coral Gables. They are extremely successful. He makes a fortune. Uh, and becomes a, a multi-millionaire, um, like Bernie Sanders. Uh, there's something about socialists becoming millionaires. I like that. Um, the, uh, this is Calvin Coolidge, who loved Florida. Um, 
I, uh, uh, <laughs> this, again, you just, you just wonder what people are, um, what people are thinking. Um, uh, he would come down to Florida, and he loved Mount Dora. I don't know how many of you have been to Mount Dora. And they have the lakeside in there. Uh, and he would stay at the lakeside inn. And he and his wife, Grace, would come out on the front porch. His cousin, who lived in uh, uh, Orlando, would drive up, pick him up, drive back to Orlando. They'd go out to dinner. And he would spend the night at her home. And uh, uh, no secret service, nothing, you know, just uh, hanging out in Orlando. And then she, the next day they'd drive back to the, uh, to the Lakeside Inn. Um, several number of years ago now, I was, uh, I was giving a speech. And, just, and, you know, frankly, as a historian, people come up and they say, oh, yeah, I knew so-and-so or... You know, President so and so stayed at my house. You know, and I never, never know whether uh, it's, it's factual or not. And uh, she said that she was the daughter of the Coolidge cousin, and still lived in the house uh, in Orlando that that Coolidge had slept in. And um, I, I didn't want to say, you know, hey, are you sure you're, you know? And uh, and she uh, then proceeded to give me her business card which convinced me, this is horrible. Her mother, to make sure everyone knew the connection, had given her the first name Coolidge. <laughs> uh, can you imagine being named Coolidge? Um, the, uh, here we go. Um, this is Herbert Hoover. Uh, Hoover and Warren G. Harding loved to come to Florida to fish. Uh, Harding, uh, I, uh, Harding came down one time and went out on a yacht off of Titusville. And, and they came up the Indian River and got stuck on a sandbar. And can you imagine if that happened today? I mean, you'd have helicopters and, uh, you know, nothing happened. The captain of the yacht said, hey, we'll have to wait till the tide comes in. Uh, Harding got bored and got in the little dinghy and rowed ashore and said, is there a, ca hire, a, ca a car I can hire a? cab and somebody said yeah and called and he d spent the afternoon just kind of driving around the area word spread quickly and when he returned to the dock he bought some fish from a fisherman to cook for dinner that night and uh there was a, a man on the dock who rushed up and shook his hand and said uh president harding we're so honored to have you here uh here we want you to take this deed to a lot and Harding said, I can't, I, I can't take that. And the man said, yes, oh, yes, we're so honored. Please take that. And finally, Harding just said, okay, you know, put it in his pocket and forgot about it. And early the next morning, the tide came in uh, and Harding left. And if he had bothered to look on shore, he would have uh, seen signs already up that read, be President Harding's neighbor, buy a home in Cocoa Beach. <laughs> The uh, Harding went along with a plan. Uh, have uh, many of you been to Sarasota? Have you been there? Have you seen the beautiful circle? Yeah. What? Saint Armand's circle? circle? No, 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 no. No, I of course speak of Harding circle. Yeah, Harding circle. Um, uh, the plan was on Longboat Key, some developers uh, were friends of Harding. They were going to build a permanent winter White House on Longboat Key. And in the center, they, built, they started with Harding Circle. And then, to keep the theme going, they started naming the streets after presidents. Next time you're down, I think it's Washington Street, Jefferson Street, or Adams Street. Jefferson, I, can, I don't know how far it goes, but it, uh, it ended abruptly when Harding died and the whole plan went south. <laughs> but there's still a Harding Circle there next time you're there. Uh, and, uh, and the roads, the first few roads are named for, for presidents of the, uh, the United States. Uh, oh, I forgot to, well, uh, Hoover loved to fish, and I don't fish, 
So some of you may appreciate this. For a number of decades, he held the, the Florida record for largest bonefish caught. He was an excellent fisherman, and he loved to come to Florida. Uh, after his election as president, he, uh, he came down and stayed at the home of his friend J.C. Penny on one, of the, on one of the islands between Miami and Miami Beach. There are three islands there, Palm and Star and another one. Pardon? Anybody know the third? Palm and Star? Anyway. Um, and uh, one day he went to a hotel for a meeting, and as you can imagine, the reporters crowded around him and said, uh, and said hey, what, what's, you know, what's going to happen? Who's going to be in your cabinet trying to pump him for information? As he stood there talking, he noticed the reporters were, were drifting away. And finally there were no reporters left. And he had turned to an aide and said, what happened? <laughs> they all left. And uh, the aide said, uh, well, uh, Mr. President, Al Capone just came in the hotel lobby. <laughs> and all the reporters had gone over to, uh, to Capone. This is the Miami Daily News announcing Capone's arrival. This was a mistake made by Al Capone. He should not have arrived. Once the hotel incident happened, uh, Hoover kind of started asking people, who's this guy? You know, he'd heard of Capone. Everyone had, but who is this guy? A couple nights later, he's asleep in the J.C. Penney mansion uh, on the island, and he hears gunfire. And he's awakened, and he goes out, and there's a servant there, and he says, I, I heard gunfire. And uh, they say, oh, yeah, it's those Capone people over on the next island where Al lived. And it leads Hoover to begin uh, really talking to people about Capone. And when he is sworn in as president, he sends for his treasury secretary. And the first order he gives is get Capone. And if you'll recall, it wasn't the prohibition people who got Capone. It was the tax people, the treasury department that got Capone. So had Al stayed in Chicago... Uh, history might have been uh, might have been uh, different. Uh, this is uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt had started coming to Florida after suffering paralysis. He believed, uh, as many people do when they uh, face illness, that he could overcome it. And his plan was he and a friend bought a yacht uh, in Fort Lauderdale. And they would go out into the Atlantic, and he believed if he swam enough that the strength would return to his legs. And uh, he tried this and tried this and kept coming down uh, to Florida and finally realized that was not going to happen. The friend and he put the, the yacht up for sale. Roosevelt calls the Fort Lauderdale paper to place a classified ad and says, for sale yacht. And uh, a couple weeks later, uh, uh, one of the hurricanes hits, one of the two 1920s vicious hurricanes hit, and uh, takes his yacht and pushes it up the river, turns it over on a bank. So it's upside down on a, on a shore on this river. Uh, 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 Roosevelt hears of what has happened. He calls the Fort Lauderdale paper says, I'd like to change my ad to For Sale Hunting Lodge. <laughs> Roosevelt uh, wins the presidency, comes to Florida shortly before his inauguration, early in 1933. He goes out, spends a week on the yacht of his friend uh, Jacob Astor of the Astors, and there's tremendous pressure in Miami for him to come there and speak. Uh, people were saying, oh, you, you owe it to us. You carried Florida. And so finally they reach a compromise. He says, okay, uh, on my way back uh, uh, to, towards the train station, we'll stop in uh, Bayfront Park, which is still there, of course. And it's hard to see, but his plan is, he's holding a microphone, his plan is just to, he's in a Buick convertible to slip up on the back of, you know, where the top goes uh, 
and say a few words. What he doesn't know is that there is an assassin in the crowd who begins firing um, and uh, hits five people around Roosevelt. There was a, uh, a lady, a Mrs. Cross, who saw this and hit his arm. Um, and uh, I was so mad. I spoke in Palm Beach about two years ago and did a Q&A at the end. And afterwards, the lady came up and said, oh, that was so nice of you to talk about my mother. I was like, you couldn't have told me that while we were... <laughs> yeah, but apparently her mother was, was Mrs. Cross um, and, uh, and saves Roosevelt's life. Uh, however, one of the bullets hits Anton Cermak, the mayor of Chicago here, uh, who dies two days later. The Secret Service is hustling Roosevelt out. They, you know, put the pedal uh, down all the way on the Buick, uh, and he orders the car stopped. He orders Cermak uh, taken in uh, to the car and holds him on the way to the uh, hospital. Basically, he dies of uh, septus, sepsis um, two days later. Not the wound, but from uh, infection uh, in uh, Florida. The, uh, uh, this is Mrs. Roosevelt with Mary Bethune, the founder of what is now Bethune-Cookman College. Uh, Mary Bethune uh, started with nothing, but was able to meet people like John D. Rockefeller, um, the white sewing machine air, all these very influential and wealthy people that she brought to Daytona Beach. Uh, she and Eleanor Roosevelt became uh, very good friends and she became uh, a presidential advisor uh, from these extremely humble beginnings, the, the daughter of uh, uh, slaves. Now this is Harry Truman who loved to go to Key West. People forget, you know, today presidents write books and they make big bucks and everything. Harry Truman was poor. I mean, poor. Uh, the, the figure they give, when he left the White House, he had $200 in his checking account. Uh, he was not a wealthy man. He had never, made, in fact, he had failed at business and never made any money. Uh, uh, and so his vacation options were very limited. Somebody tells him, hey, Mr. President, uh, there's this great house on Key West owned by the Navy. If you stay there, you can take a, a boat down, a uh, Navy ship. Uh, the Navy will pay for that. They'll drop you off at the house on, in Key West at the Navy base. The Navy mess will furnish all your meals. And basically, you'll get a free vacation. And he loved that idea and became a regular of his eight years as president, he spent an average of one month a year at Key West. Eight months of his eight-year term was spent in this, uh, in this house. After he left the White House, though, he never, never came back. He, uh, uh, really strange. This is John Kennedy outside the Catholic Church in uh, Palm Beach. What John Kennedy did not know uh, is that uh, he had narrowly averted death that day. Um, uh, a, a man with serious mental issues, uh, who went, uh, wasn't just Kennedy, he would have killed any president. He had threatened Eisenhower, uh, uh, had serious problems, uh, went, into the, uh, went to the church, and a Secret Service agent noticed he was kind of shabby and looked out of place and seemed nervous and went up and in effect threw him out of the church uh, but took the license plate number of his old car and they began to look for this guy. Uh, when they finally found him, they found that his car was packed with dynamite and his plan had been to run it into the Kennedy home. He said that he was waiting outside uh, and that Kennedy came out of the house and he prepared to, to hit the gas and that uh, at that moment Mrs. Kennedy and their daughter came out and he said that he didn't want to kill them and that was the only reason that he did not um, kill the president that day. Um, Kennedy, uh, his father bought uh, the house in the 1930s
if any of you are from Pennsylvania, you know the Wanamaker family, uh, the department store family. They bought it from the Wanamakers. John Kennedy was older than the little kids, and so he never spent much time there. It's only after World War II, when he has the horrible problems with his back, that he becomes a regular at Palm Beach. He goes there for, after his surgeries. He has several surgeries. One required two months of rest. So he goes to the Palm Beach house. Uh, it is there he writes Profiles in Courage, the Pulitzer Prize winning book with his aide, Ted Sorensen. Uh, it is uh, there that he writes his inaugural address and names most of his uh, cabinet uh, members. Uh, he is there on the last weekend of his life. Uh, this is uh, him with George Smathers, the Democratic senator from uh, Florida in Miami. Uh, he uh, spent the weekend in, in Palm Beach in Miami, then went to Tampa for a union speech, over to the Cape for uh, 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 inspection of the space program, and then back to Washington, and then, of course, on to, uh, on to Dallas. Anybody know who this guy is? God, you're good. <laughs> Walt Disney with his mom. Uh, and why do, what's he doing in this, you ask? Um, what is strange to me is that two events occur simultaneously that change both our nation and Florida. Disney is, uh, di people don't realize the Disney family had lived in Florida. They lived over in Lake County. Um, and both, um, let's see, I'll get this right. His father and his mother's families had come to Florida uh, to show you uh, how lightly populated it was. Lake County breaks off from Orange County in 1887, okay, the po population is so low that it's nine months before they issue their first uh, marriage license. Nine months. That license is issued to Walt Disney's parents. They are the first people married in, in Lake County to get a license in Lake County. Uh, the, I, uh, he uh, opens Disneyland in California. And almost immediately they realize, hey, we ought to do something east of the Mississippi. So they um, begin planning, and um, he flies into Tampa uh, and uh, drives up to Ocala. Had, and, okay, and then drives back. He looks at land in Ocala. He had come down here as a child. He knew Ocala well to visit his cousins. Uh, they would go to Ocala or over to Daytona. Uh, the second day, he has to get back to California, so instead of driving to Orlando, he flies over. At uh, 1 o'clock, he flies over where the turnpike and I-4 meet, and he points out the window and says, that's it. And at that moment, Florida changes forever. Uh, the plane banks, heads back for California. They stop in New Orleans for gas, and when they do... Uh, one of the ground crew come up and say, Mr. Disney, did you hear that at 1 o'clock this afternoon, President Kennedy was killed in Dallas? And so it's strange that at the exact moment, these two events that would change our state and the nation and the world are, uh, are occurring. Had Walt, by the way, done the opposite, had he driven to Orlando and flown over Ocala, Disney World today would be in Ocala. What he did not know pointing out the window was that he was pointing to a swamp. And it took a year longer than planned just to fill in the, uh, the swamp. Um, uh, this is Richard Nixon. I love Nixon no matter what he was doing. Fishing, I don't care what, he always wore a suit. Um, um, he is playing golf with Jackie Gleason. Uh, one, of the one of the photos on the cover is of Jackie Gleason playing with Gerald Ford. Jackie Gleason played golf with about seven consecutive presidents in South Florida. Um, what strikes me as interesting about this is uh, just the irony, I guess, 
is that uh, they are playing at the Doral Country Club uh, in the 1970s, which of course is now owned by President Trump. Um, so it's kind of uh, strange. Uh, two speeches were given in Florida, in Orlando, uh, that are really kind of signature speeches by presidents. Um, this is Richard Nixon. Um, I say he's speaking at Disney World. Disney World says he's not. Um, you can believe me or Disney World. Um, he is giving his I am not a crook speech uh, at Disney World. If you, this is true. If you go to the Disney site, uh, I think I get this. They claim there were seven presidents who went to Disney World. And I count eight. Uh, well, the poor Nixon, they stopped counting him. He was speaking at a hotel on Disney property right outside the gate. Oh, no, he didn't come in, though, so we don't have to count him. Um, and the other, of course, was uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, who makes his evil empire speech here uh, in, or, uh, in Orlando. Uh, there he is. So um, the, uh, th this is a final picture. Um, this is a man named Leroy Collins, who is generally considered Florida's greatest governor, served during the 1950s. After he left office, um, he uh, uh, took a, uh, a job. Lyndon Johnson asked him to take a job uh, uh, coordinating between the federal government and the civil rights movement. You know, hey, do we need U.S. Marshals? Do we need this? Do we need, what do you, you know, kind of a coordinator so that nothing fell between the cracks. So this is the Selma March. The famous Selma March we just celebrated, I don't know if celebrates the right word, we just honored with the 55th anniversary. Uh, you see Andrew Young, uh, Dr. King, Coretta King, and uh, Ralph Abernathy, and, uh, and Leroy Collins. Uh, uh, in 1968, Collins decides to run for the United States Senate. He runs against a man uh, who really liked dirty tricks, uh, who uh, was later indicted, frankly, um, named Ed Gurney. And Ed Gurney wants to uh, trash Leroy Collins any way he can. And so they print up thousands of copies of this picture to, uh, uh, to send around the state to uh, let voters know or imply that Governor Collins is a friend of Dr. King's, that he'll push for civil rights, that he's a liberal in, uh, in Florida, and it destroys the, uh, the, the campaign of uh, Governor Collins, and he loses to, to Ed Gurney. Um, a public relations firm in Orlando uh, is hired to uh, handle the, the distribution of these pictures, which is going to retake some effort. And so they, uh, they begin looking for a, uh, uh, a young man you know, or, or a woman, they don't care, who can, you know, mail these out, get them out all around and things like that. And they find a young man who just has, wants to get into politics, wants to learn politics, and secondly, has some time to kill before going uh, into the uh, National Guard. And so George Bush is hired <laughs> to carry out this campaign to discredit uh, Leroy uh, Collins. And of course, George Bush will be in Sarasota uh, when, uh, when he learns from Andy Card, his chief of staff, uh, about 9-11. Um, uh, there's a reporter in Orlando uh, who's still very young, um, uh, relatively speaking, but uh, the, the worst assignment in the room or in, in media is being a pool reporter for something like this with the President of the United States. Uh, you have to get there early. You can't say anything. You just stand there and you're locked in. You can't leave. You can't go to the bathroom. You can't get anything to drink. You just stand there. And so this young reporter was working for a TV station. He was starting out in Sarasota. And, and uh, somebody said, oh, okay, we got to be the pool reporter for today at the elementary school where Bush was visiting. And every go, oh, I don't want to do that, I don't want to do that. And finally they made this young reporter, okay, you're the junior guy, you have to go. And so he was standing just over there uh, when, uh, when history happened. Very.
very dra dramatic. Um, and this is President Obama, who they do claim at Disney World, um, and uh, uh, who also um, went uh, swimming uh, in the Gulf after the BP oil uh, disaster um, uh, back then. And that's it. That's presidents in Florida. Uh, I will add, and this is still a, you know, kind of an, a work in progress. Florida has never had a presidential candidate, a vice presidential candidate. We've never had a president. We've never had a vice president. Nothing. Uh, zero. Nobody likes us. And of course, <laughs> and of course, now uh, we do. President Trump has moved uh, from uh, New York City to uh, Mar-a-Lago, which was built almost the 100th anniversary, 1925, by Marjorie uh, Merriweather Post, the heiress to the Post serial fortune. And uh, she left the house to the, to the federal government. Yeah, you just wonder what the federal government thinks sometime. And the Park Service, you know, this mansion, you've all seen pictures of it. Uh, her idea was that it would be used for visiting dig dignitaries. The Park Service says, well, that's not in our budget, uh, so we'll sell it. And they sold it for a song. Trump really worked one of the great deals, but, you know, the Park Service didn't care. It's your money. They're not theirs. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was able to, uh, to pick it up for uh, very little money and turn it into a, uh, uh, a country club. My favorite part is that for almost a decade, he... Uh, he battled the uh, 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 Palm Beach Airport, uh, which is the house is in the flight path, and now of course he gets to control the flight path. So 